It's Wednesday, the 3rd of January, 2007. This is Photo Walkthrough, show number 45, tutorial 11, chapter 5. And it's less than a month now before our official one-year anniversary. Photo Walkthrough was first launched as a podcast on the 1st of February, 2006. And on today's show, we're going to finish up tutorial 11, our wheelbarrow image. I've got some news about Adobe Photoshop CS3 Beta, and I've got a big announcement about Photo Walkthrough's latest partner. The first piece of news today is something that I blogged back in December, just before my whirlwind Christmas began. Adobe have released a beta test version of Adobe Photoshop CS3. It's available to anyone who's got a licensed version of Photoshop CS2, Creative Suite 2, Adobe Production Studio, or Adobe Video Bundle, or Adobe Web Bundle. If you don't have a licensed version of one of those, you can still download it and try it, but it'll only be active for two days. As far as I know, this is the first time Adobe have released a beta of Photoshop, and I, for one, am very excited by what I've seen so far. I've been playing with CS3 all over Christmas, and some of the new features are excellent. First on most people's list will be the new smart filters that actually allow you to apply filters to a bitmap layer in a way that leaves them re-editable. This makes filters non-destructive edits for the first time ever. Another huge feature is the new RAW plugin, which is still very much unfinished in the beta, but it looks like it's sharing a lot of the same functionality as Lightroom. Those of you that listened to my Lightroom beta review a couple of months ago will know that I absolutely love the RAW conversion features in that product, and it looks like we might get a lot of those same features in the Adobe Photoshop RAW converter. There's also a new selection tool in CS3, the Quick Selection tool, and there's also the Refine Edges feature. Both features do a lot to help make high-quality selections, especially for cutting objects out of complex backgrounds. Then there's the new Photo Merge feature for stitching panoramas, and the associated Align and Blend Layers features. If you've been watching Photo Walkthrough for a while, you'll know that I, st I didn't think much of the CS2 Photo Merge, but this new version in for CS3 is simply stunning. I've tried it on some panoramas that my previous favourite, Auto Stitch, simply couldn't manage, and it's producing some great results. There's also changes to the user interface that should make it easier to keep screen space clear for your image. Then there's the new clone stamping features and two new adjustment layer types that could prove extremely useful. There's a new version of Bridge, a couple of new blending modes, a photo downloader taking from Photoshop elements of all places, and all sorts of tweaks to existing features, such as an improved brightness and contrast tool, much improved curves dialog, and new features in the vanishing point filter. There are too, too many new features for me to explain them all today, but look out for something from me very soon talking about the beta a bit more. If you'd like to try it for yourself, and if you use Photoshop a lot, then I really recommend that you do, then visit labs.adobe.com slash technologies slash Photoshop CS3. And you can download it for yourself there, and don't worry, it installs alongside your existing CS2, so you can try out CS3 without breaking your existing Photoshop installation. Also this week, I've got a big announcement related to this show, Photo Walkthrough. I love producing the show, and I've been making little tweaks to the format all the way along. So today I'm really excited to announce that at the end of last year, after months thinking it over, I decided to sign up with Podshow, and I'll tell you why. First of all, you should know that most podcasts, mine included, are produced by just one person, or a couple of people working in their own spare time. It's often a lot of work. My show takes a whole day to produce each episode, sometimes more. And the people producing the shows are skilled usually at whatever the show's about. Often they're not skilled at promotion, marketing, speaking to sponsors, or PR agencies, or any of the other things that traditional media has whole departments of people doing. So as a little guy, it's really useful to have a company like Podshow available to help out with those things. It's like outsourcing your PR, or hiring an agent. Podshow will help me find sponsors for Photo Walkthrough. The folks in charge there have a high enough profile to go knocking on the doors of the biggest companies out there who simply wouldn't speak to a little guy like me. But they'll also do more than that. They're available to help me with promoting my show or talking to traditional media and PR companies. They're on hand to offer advice and guidance, and in some cases have helped podcasters to quit their day jobs and do podcasting full-time. Now, I've said the word sponsor, and yes, that means you'll likely encounter ads as part of my show in the future. Rest assured, though, that you'll always know when it's an ad and when it's not, and I'll never let the ads take over. The value in a show like this is that you have to trust what I say, so I'm going to do my best to keep earning that trust. 
I don't want to be shy about the fact that I'm hoping to make some money out here either. Sure, I'd love you all to think that I'm doing this simply out of the kindness of my heart, and so far that's been true. But as we've become more successful, and as the show takes more of my time, I need to be able to justify the time I spend to my wife and my family, who rely on me to help run our family business. Any of you that are in business for yourselves will know that paid work and family always come first, so receiving just a little income from doing the show will go a long way to justifying the time I spend, and will make sure that Photo Walkthrough keeps going. So there we are, Photo Walkthrough is part of Podshow now. I like to think that I can do everything for myself, but the truth is I needed help with promoting and marketing my show, and so I asked Podshow to help out. I'm really enjoying producing the show, and as long as I do, I'll keep producing it and it will always be free. And now that Podshow's on board, I'm genuinely excited about the possibilities for the future. And there's just one final piece of news for this week. I've just added to the homepage of photowalkthrough.com a dig button. For those of you that don't know, dig is a website where you can dig or just uh, vote for a news story or a website that you particularly like, and they've just launched their podcast section. So I've just stuck a button on our homepage where you can click on it to go and dig the photo walkthrough show on dig.com. If you happen to be a dig user, um, I'd love it if you went over there and, and dug the show. Uh, it is going to help us get the word out about the show and build our listener numbers, so that would be a big help. And as far as I can tell, digging the show is something you'll only ever have to do once. So if you'd be willing to go over there and do that, I'd be really grateful. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'm taking a week off from doing a composition segment this week. That's partly because it takes so long to prepare and partly because today's show is already pretty long. But I'm going to set an assignment for those of you that want to take part anyway. This week, I'd love it if you posted your favourite Christmas picture, something taken this year, and it can be of anything you like, your family, your cat, your Christmas tree, anything you like, and as usual, I'll include as many of those as I can at the end of next week's show. Um, and at the end of this week's show, uh, the submissions to the Vanishing Point assignment will be shown, and boy did we get some great submissions to this one. Well done everyone that posted, I think these are some of the best submissions I've seen. The next step is going to be to do a little bit of dodging and burning just to bring out the light on those spokes. So as you've seen me do many times before, I'm going to make a new layer just by clicking the, uh, the new layer icon at the bottom of the layers palette here. And I'm going to choose soft light as the blending mode. Uh, now with a brush, get to our brush tool with the B key. And now yeah, that was way too strong. Okay, let's. I'm toying with a new graphics tablet here, and it appears that I have it set a little bit, a little bit strong. So, with any luck, you'll hear fairly soon about my experiences with these new graphics tablets. I'm working on a, a Christmas special. A couple of you have written in um, to say that you you love the fact that um, the Wacom tablets help you do some uh, some of these edits more accurately, but you never know which one to buy, and it's further complicated by the fact that there are certain tablets available in Europe that aren't available in America, which is a real shame because <laughs> by and large the European ones are cheaper. Um, but the show that I'm working on, I will hopefully give you some tips on how to decide which one to buy if that's what you're interested in doing. Um, so maybe if you find yourself with a little bit of money over Christmas, Christmas present money, you might find a bit of spare cash to buy a graphics tablet. So all I'm doing here, um, just doing it while I talk to you really, um, I've just, as you can see, I'm just bringing the the shadows of those spokes up a little bit anywhere where the detail looks a little bit um, starting to look a little blown out on the edge of the wheelbarrow there um, just here I mean I'm just going to drag the opacity up a little bit just painting a little bit of black on my dodge burn layer all I'm doing 
just burning a little bit more detail in along that edge. Um, I don't want to put too much more in there because I know I'm going to sharpen this later. Um, now I've just put some black into the body of the wheelbarrow there and I don't want it so oops that was an eraser with a completely hard edge so let's go for a soft edge I'm changing the softness of the edge of the brush if you look up here you can see the brush in the uh, in the, the options bar here if you press shift and the left square bracket on, on a British or American keyboard um, you can change the uh, you can soften the brush if you shift and the right square bracket hardens the edge of the brush um, and likewise the square bracket keys without the shift key changes the size of the brush. You can see the number changing there. So I want a reasonably large brush and I want a very soft edge and once again that's too heavy an edit. I'll just drag the opacity down and clean up the mess that I made there. So going back to my dodge burn brush I tend to do more, more burning than dodging but don't forget that, that as well as painting black on this layer to to burn, you can also paint white on this layer to dodge. So if I wanted, for example, um, let's find a good place to do it. Um, I'm looking at the front of this wheel here. Now we've got some nice detail on, on that front edge of the, of the wheelbarrow, um, and we've got some nice detail on the wheel, but the wheel is a little bit dark, maybe. So if I switch to white, and I'm switching colour with the X key, if I switch to white, and paint gently across the front of the wheel there. You can see that's 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 dodging. It's lightening the detail on the front of the wheel. I've probably gone a little bit far with that. Let's go back to my eraser and drag the opacity down to say 10%, something like that. And just a couple of strokes over there just to back off the change I just did a little bit. Okay. I think that's looking pretty good. Um, just turning on and off that dodge burn layer. The, these things, the dodge burn layers, tend to be... You can spend as little or as much time on these as you like, really, is what, I, what I'm trying to say. Oh, look, I'm seeing a lot of... a lot of nastiness in the... Let's put the opacity of that way up to 30-odd. I'm, I'm not liking what I did with the dodge burn on the inside of the wheelbarrow there. Yeah. The other thing you need to be aware of, sometimes you'll do these edits, um, you'll turn them on and off, and it'll be really obvious when you turn them on and off what you did, but you've got to remember the person that's viewing it is not going to be turning the layer on and off. So you really need to, to, to be able to see what you've done without that. What you're doing when you're turning it on and off is you're, you're letting your eyes see movement, um, and there's not going to be movement in the final image. So. You need to make the change and then leave it for a moment and see whether or not it really looks that bad. Um, in this case, I don't like what I've done, so I'm just evening out a little bit some of those bits in the middle there. Okay. Right, I'm going to leave the dodge burn there. Again, it's possible to spend a lot longer on this, but probably shouldn't, don't want to take up too much of your time today. Um, so moving on, that's dodge and burn done. We also, I think that's pretty much our, our, our luminosity layer done except for uh, a sharpening layer which I'll do at the end. Um, I tend to do sharpening at the end because typically sharpening is something you would do before printing. But in this case I'm not really sharpening for printing, I'm sharpening for grit, I'm sharpening for, for, um, for stylistic reasons. So under those circumstances, I would sharpen and save the image with the sharpening layer in. But I would definitely do sharpening on a layer so that if I wanted to, I could go back and change it. Um, but before we do that, let's just do our, our color blurring. Now, this, this is really easy. Um, I'm going to just take our background layer that we've got in that color group. I can turn the little arrow on the luminosity group, just keep this, this palette, layers palette nice and simple. Um, and I'm just going to go filter, blur, Gaussian blur, or Gaussian blur, depending on who you listen to. Um, and let's just find a bit that's going to be... I always look at this plant down here. You can you can drag this around, or you can click here on your image. So I always look at this plant down here, and let's just go for... 
something like that. Let's just see how that looks. Right. Now that's not making a huge difference. Let's zoom in. As you can see, the focal plane's about here. Focal plane is, is about level with the front of the wheelbarrow. So that colour edit, not huge actually. I think we've probably not done enough there. So going back to our history, I'm going to undo that Gaussian blur. And then I'm going to blur this again. Let's go back to double click on the on the drag hand, it goes back to full screen. And then we're going to go filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and yeah, that's not nearly enough. I really need to completely lose the detail in that. So let's try there. That's that's a much, much heavier blur. And we should now find, yeah, if I turn this on and off, you can see we're getting detail. We've got green here. We've got, whoops, let's go back out. Problem with the graphics tablet, sometimes you find yourself clicking when you don't mean to. Um, we've got green here in the leaf and we've got brownie grey around it. If I turn that colour layer on, it all just smushes out so that we've just got a sort of a hint of colour. There is still some green here, but the leaf itself is, is too small to really to really hold on to its colour on its own. So it just makes it, it gives it a sort of a uh, a, a dreamlike sort of feeling. There is still, you can see, bluish on the side of the, the wheelbarrow there, but it's it's a lot less than it was. The, if I turn that colour layer off, the colour is much better defined and therefore the colour appears more saturated. If I turn that on, the brown here, if you can see here, the brown on the edge of the wheelbarrow here is starting to bleed into the blue on the on the side of the wheelbarrow. And I just I think that that's a very interesting effect. I think it, it adds a lot to the style of the image. Right, and the final step <clears throat> is sharpening. Um, now, the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to take, um, once again, I'm going to take our background layer and I'm going to drag it to the new layer icon. Um, and this time I'm going to call it sharpen. And I want it at the top. I want it above the luminosity layer. Um, and I think we could do this as another group. Another way to make a group that I didn't tell you about. If you've got some layers that you that you want to turn into a group, select them and press Control G on your keyboard, Command G on a Mac, and we'll make this our sharpening layer. And in this case, we're going to make it a pass-through layer, which means that it's just going to be everything you see in this layer. Um, no, we're not going to make it a pass-through layer. We're going to make it a soft light layer in a minute. I'll leave it as sharp as pass-through for now. But our, our sharpen layer is going to be filtered and we're going to use this high pass filter which is under filter other high pass and I believe you've seen me do this before but what I'm looking for here normally when you're doing the sharpen with high pass um, you're doing it sharpening for print uh, in this case I'm sharpening as I said for stylistic reasons um, so I will be a lot more aggressive and you can see that one of the things that's interesting about the high pass if you if you keep the values low sort of 10 or less you get a, a, a very monochrome sort of image. The more you drag it up, the more colour starts to seep through. So you, what you're doing is you're looking, you're analysing the differences of, of adjacent pixels. And, and this is working on the colour image. So colour will start to appear as you as you choose larger radiuses for this, um, which is fine. I'm, I'm going to just desaturate it in a minute to, to correct that. But what I'm after really is not these hard edges here. You can see all the way along here we've got a very hard edge and if I do this um, that hard edge there is going to be a really nasty sharpening line but I'm not going to include that because this is going to be a selective sharpen. I'm going to use a layer mask. So anywhere where you would normally uh, if you did a very aggressive sharpen with with another sharpening tool it would give you some nasty halos. Doesn't matter so much here so we can be a lot more aggressive because we're going to be much more selective about which bits of the sharpening we use. Now the bits of the sharpening I want are going to be 
on the front of the wheel here and down the front of that wheelbarrow edge. So this is this is a very strong sharpen now. 52.1 is a lot sharper than you would a lot harsher than you would normally use. Now I said I was going to desaturate this la layer before I did anything else. So image adjustments desaturate takes all the color out. That's just going to average the color information in that and and throw it away. Uh, sorry, and use it for luminosity and then throw the color information away. Um, so we've got a black and white sharpening layer now, and to that sharpening layer I'm going to add a layer mask by pressing the Add Layer Mask button here. And I'm going to start just by, uh, with black as my foreground colour, Alt Delete or Option Delete on a Mac fills that layer mask with black. So the sharpening layer, invisible now, because I've filled it all with black, black conceals the layer. What I'm going to do next is with my brush, and with white as my foreground colour, and I'm going to choose an opacity in the region of sort of 50-ish, I think. I'm just going to start painting in some of those areas where I'm going to want sharpness. Um, just make my edge, brush edge a little bit softer. And I'm going, to, I'm going to paint it in fairly aggressively. For the time being, it's going to look like grey. It's going to look like I'm silvering it. It's not, it's not, it's not going to look like sharpness yet. Um, now the places I remember that that uh, I was going to get nasty halos are places where there was very strong contrast. That's because what the high pass filter is doing is it's looking for areas of strong contrast, um, and we've told it to be very aggressive with that. So that edge there is the strongest contrast of the whole image. We've got a light side of a, a wheelbarrow next to a dark ground. So that's one place I absolutely do not want to paint this sharpening in. Places I do want the sharpening are uh, where there's just that sort of gritty detail, which is what I'm trying to reveal. Um, and I'm pressing fairly hard on there just to put the sharpening layer in as strongly as possible on those two areas that I particularly want to sharpen up. Um, now, it's not a sharpening layer yet, it's just a grey layer at the moment. What makes it a sharpening layer is if I take the blending mode and set it to soft light. So let's zoom in on one of those areas I've sharpened and turn the layer on and off and see what it does. Now you can see that is, uh, like always, sharpening doesn't sharpen. What it does is it increases contrast in adjacent pixels, but it gives the illusion of sharpening. And soft light is probably the most gentle uh, setting we could use for this. Let's just try a stronger setting, which would be overlay. And you can see right away that if I turn that on and off, that's adding considerable amount of extra contrast as well as um, extra apparent sharpness. So that's probably the one I, I would choose for this, but another blending mode that you could use that might sometimes be useful um, is hard light, which in this case doesn't appear to make an enormous difference, but let's just go from overlay to hard light now. Uh, we're going to stick with overlay in this case. But um, this is all down to how much you want the sharpening layer to have effect. And remember, you can, if you want, uh, change the opacity on that. To It's going to be difficult to see on the video, but if I drag the opacity down, it backs the effect off, and we've got total control over how much of that sharpening we want. So that's a pretty good place to leave it. Um, that is the end of this particular image. Uh, thank you very much for watching. That's it for today. I'll be back next week with the first chapter of a new image. But before we finish, here are the wonderful submissions to the last assignment, Vanishing Point. Yeah.
photocastnetwork.com, your photography resource in the potosphere. photocastnetwork.com